Let's go. Good. Okay. Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome, and thank you for joining us. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Igor Marjanovic, and I'm the dean of the Rice School of Architecture. It's my pleasure to welcome you today uh, for this uh, very special event with our visiting artist, Rana Begum. Architecture, as we all know, is a very broad, uh, wide discipline that touches upon on many different spheres of life. Uh, technology, sociology, uh, history, theory, making, drawing, and as such, we have many uh, wonderful partners and collaborations across campus uh, where we explore different ways in how architecture interacts with different disciplines. But um, one partner in particular, I would say, stands out, and that is the Moody Center for the Arts. Uh, we, because of our shared belief in the power of imagination and creative practice uh, to tackle some of the most important issues of our time and to really fundamentally help transform how we both see the world and how we uh, build, uh, build the world. With that in mind, I'm really uh, delighted to introduce today's event, uh, which is developed in collaboration with the Moody Center, uh, and in, in particular to welcome Frauke Josenhans, who is a curator uh, from the center and also a curator of the show that's going to open tonight uh, at the Moody at 6 p.m., so everybody is invited. Uh, the show is called Urban Impressions, Experiencing the Global Contemporary Metropolis. Uh, and it looks at different ways as how we as citizens, as architects, um, experience and perceive the contemporary and changing uh, city today. Uh, thank you, Frauke, for bringing this important exhibition to the Moody and to the campus community, and in particular for sharing uh, Rana Begum's campus participation with the Rice School of Architecture. Uh, Frauke uh, will be joined uh, by Maggie Tseng, uh, our own faculty member here in the School of Architecture. Uh, they will moderate a conversation with Rana about her site-specific installations here on campus. Uh, Maggie is an assistant professor working on the intersections of uh, ecology, urbanism, and architecture, and also a superstar, having just recently won the 2022 uh, Architectural League of New York Prize, which is one of the most esteemed uh, uh, prizes in the field of architecture. Uh, they will be joined by our guest, Rana Begum, who is a Bangladeshi-born artist currently based in London, who works in a very interesting interdisciplinary space in between sculpture, painting, and architecture. In that sense, her work is very pluralistic in terms of the kind of different fields uh, that it brings together, but it is also pluralistic in a sense of culture because she's weaving the tradition of modern and abstract art together with the history of the Islamic art and architecture. As, that, as such, her work is very, uh, very powerful presence, both in the Urban Impressions exhibitions, but also in our annual lecture series, Engaging Pluralism. So without much more ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Frauke, Rana, and Maggie to our event today. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Igor, for this uh, very nice introduction, and uh, a huge thank you to Maggie Tsang for inviting me to co-moderate this conversation today. And of course, our gratitude goes to Rana, who is trying to figure out how to put up her PowerPoint. <laughs> so we will hear more from her. And I just wanted to give a very brief introduction to the exhibition, uh, Urban Impressions, Experiencing, uh, Experiencing the Global Contemporary Metropolis, that's on you at the Moody, and um, how the place of Rana's work in that exhibition and um, so, uh, again, we are always thrilled to partner with other institutions here on campus, and especially with the School of Architecture. There's so many uh, parallels between our interests, of course, shared interests, uh, shared artists that we um, admire. So it's a really, it's, um, it's a great opportunity when we can do a project and collaborate around um, such an amazing artist such as Rana. So a few words about the exhibition. Um, Urban Impressions uh, reconsiders the contemporary metropolis today and asks the question, what makes the city? So it's not only the visual aspect, of course. The built environment is omnipresent as we walk through the city, but there are so many other sensations that play into our perception of the city. It's the noises that we hear of the traffic, it's the human voices, animals. Uh, there's so many sensations that play into how we um, apprehend the urban environment. And so the exhibition really tries to evoke all these different sensations, the bodily experience of the city, the sensorial experience, the visual experience as well. 
And so the different artists that I invited or whose work I selected for the exhibition convey in their work these different aspects. Some in a more conceptually way, uh, others are more explicit. But for me it was important to bring together a group of international artists who in their work really engage with the question of what is the city and what is our place within the city. And so, of course, there's a very long tradition of depicting the city, the urban environment in, in the arts, in the visual arts. It's a topic of fascination, and we all have an, an opinion on the city, right? So I really want to stress that the focus is on the city today and the, all the different histories, collective memories that goes into what we see and experience today. And I think all of the artists and artworks really convey that sensation. So, um, and uh, I also want to just mention that tomorrow, so Igor mentioned very kindly that the exhibition opens tonight at 6 p.m. at the Moody, and tomorrow we will have a special student opening from 3 to 5 p.m. So everyone is welcome to join tonight, tomorrow, and to experience the artworks for themselves. But today we are really so thrilled that Rana is here with us. She came from London earlier this week to help us install her really fantastic installation. And actually, um, I really want to, uh, I also want to highlight that there is a permanent work by Rana here on campus, one of her fantastic folk sculptures that you can see at the Jones School, um, the Jones Business School, and it's part of the Wright Public Art Collection. We installed that work earlier today, and I hope after Rana's talk today, you will all run over to the Jones School and take a look for yourself, because it's really quite captivating, that piece. And it gives another sense of her really broad practice. So Rana, I think her work, uh, what really um, appealed to me in particular, I mean visually it's really stunning, but it's also so intriguing because it really situates itself at the intersection of art, architecture, and um, when you look at her work, it's hard to really define it. So I often use the term installation when I refer to your current work here, because it, it can be seen as both a sculpture, an architectural installation, and almost like a painting, depending on where you stand. And that is really also what makes your work so intriguing and beautiful, that it's not uh, limited to one field, one idea, but really encompass, on, on, encompasses so many different ideas. Um, and so just uh, to give you a little bit of background on Rana, because uh, her career is really quite amazing. <laughs> and I need to take a look at my notes, because there are so many things to say about it. <laughs> but just very briefly, that uh, Rana, she earned a BA from the Chelsea College of Art and Design in London. And then she continued her studies in painting at the Slade School of Art and graduated there with an MFA in 2002. And since then, she has really engaged uh, in so many different projects and working on different scales, from smaller sculptures to really big monumental installations, to paintings, to watercolors as well. So there's a really a wonderful um, broad area that, again, touches on so many different fields. And she has shown her work around the world, of course, in the United Kingdom, in Sweden, in South Korea, um, in the Netherlands, really everywhere. Her work has been awarded by uh, different prices. She received the Jack Goldhill Award for Sculpture in 2012 and the Abrash Group Art Prize in 2017. And she was also elected a Royal Academician in 2019. And so she works and lives in London. And I also want to give a very special shout out to Anna Ryan Flynn, who's here with us today, her amazing studio director, who's been really instrumental. So um, I just want to acknowledge her great uh, help uh, with this wonderful project. And so I, um, knowing, I've been interested in Rana's work for a very long time, and then thinking about the exhibition on the global contemporary metropolis, it just made very much sense to me to invite an artist whose work engages so much with architecture and who uses a very minimalist, minimalist long language in her work, but then infuses it with color and really thinks about how light, natural and artificial light, will change and activate the artwork. And uh, so I invited Rana to be part of our, of our exhibition, Urban Impressions. And um, so she accepted the invitation. And we had many, many different meetings over Zoom. <laughs> she made a wonderful first proposal, uh, which was fantastic, very ambitious. And then looking at the site, at the Moody, and then also thinking about bringing a second part, a second version of it to the School of Architecture. We decided on this entrance area in front of the Moody and this wonderful lawn space in front of the School of Architecture. And so we had um, various discussions, but she was really interested 
um, in using industrial material that she often uses in her work, so material that is not normally used in the fine arts, but then how these very industrial rough material is transformed by light and color, of course, which is so essential to your overall body of work. So we um, sourced uh, these uh, mesh panels that were then powder coated and then assembled in this really power, wonderful towering structure, and you will tell us more about it. And um, since this is also a wonderful moment to acknowledge so many different people, I want to also really thank um, and express my gratitude to Lee Clark, our Associate Director of Exhibitions, who has been so crucial <laughs> in sourcing the many, many components of this amazing installation. So a huge out to Lee and to all of the Moody team, of course. And. Um, so your installation uh, number 1187, MESH, uh, it's, it's part of a series, but it's a really site-specific commission here for the Moody and for the Rice campus. And it's also part of our platform series. So it was a great opportunity to make all these different connections with the School of Architecture, the exhibition, and our platform series, where we invite artists to respond to the Rice campus, the architecture, and the landscape here. So it was just a perfect fit for everyone. <laughs> And of course, it takes a village or a city to bring together uh, an exhibition um, or an installation as ambitious as Juana's uh, installation here. So I want to acknowledge the great help that we received, the very physical, active help that we received from the School of Architecture. Um, so Brian Miller was very kind to organize a group of students from the Rice School of Architecture to help us actually build this structure. And uh, again, Rana will tell you more about the process, but it was a really long, laborious process. And we had various um, students from the School of Architecture helping us assemble the mesh panels and then building the towering structure. So I'm just going to read their names. So a huge thank you goes to Emily Wilcox, to Priya Davis, to Peyton Chang, to Theodore Vado, Tiffany Wu, and to Roxana Mandez. So thank you to all of you for your help working with Rana, with Anna, and the Moody team on this installation. And also I want to acknowledge the help of Maggie Martin um, for the exhibition, Urban Impression. She did a fantastic job uh, on the exhibition design. So thank you to all of you. And now, without further ado, I will hand it over to Rana. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all the lovely things that you were saying about um, my career. Um, I, um, you kind of like, it's kind of weird hearing all of that because you don't, <laughs> you don't, you just kind of carry on. You don't think about um, all the different achievements, but I mean, I'm, I am where I am because of all the people that I've been able to collaborate, have conversations with, and that have supported me over the years. So um, it's, it's really important to kind of acknowledge everyone that's kind of contributed. Um, I started off, so I'm going to talk about a bit about, I know that Farouk was saying that it's really difficult to kind of pin down um, a discipline with my work and it's really important for me that I don't get pinned down. I'm, I started off as a figurative artist and when I was doing my foundation course at university, which is a year of where you get to explore all the different aspects of the arts. Um, was where it really opened my eyes. And actually, I wanted to do architecture. Um, I'm glad I didn't do architecture <laughs> because I am a workaholic, but I think um, architects have it quite tough um, and engineers have it quite tough as well. So I don't envy you guys. Um, I am in a really fortunate position where I get to collaborate with architects, uh, engineers, designers, musicians, writers, um, artists as well. And I decided to take a path where it really kept my um, opportunities open. And so I ended up doing fine art painting at, for my BA and for my masters um, at Chelsea and at Slade. And I think it was, for me, it was the best thing. Um, I was able to really um, draw on various kind of disciplines and have conversations with people. And I just found it incredibly rewarding. Um, I'm gonna show you a um, couple of public art projects. Uh, it says it's very confidential, so it should not go out of this room. Um, sorry, we had to send it out. Um, 
uh, images and there's some stuff in there that um, now it's it's okay to show. Um, this is a, a, a the, one of the most recent projects that um, I've done in London. So there's like quite a few things happened um, at the same time in the UK. And this is a project that I've been working on, I would say probably four years. Um, and it was an absolute nightmare to start off with. Um, because of all the challenges that we had. Um, it's a site um, along the Thames and it's not an island but it's um, kind of, I, I can't remember what you call it, but um, it's surrounded by kind of residential towers um, and I was quite frustrated um, with the site because I felt um, actually the architect uh, missed the opportunity of the location because um, on the outer perimeter of the, of the site uh, you get this incredible view of London and so but most of the residential towers kind of are facing in and the way the buildings are kind of laid out um, these kind of open spaces become kind of wind tunnels and so trying to actually, um, and the other thing is that art always becomes an afterthought um, in, in those kind of situations and artists are usually brought in to kind of um, deal with something or a space that has, you know, an opportunity has been kind of missed uh, to really collaborate. Um, so the initial site was a lot bigger and a lot more kind of open but it was quite, um, quite intense in terms of the way the, um, the wind kind of is going through the space. Um, so, and the other um, difficulty and challenge I had was um, being able to have a structure that would hold the artwork. And so over um, a two year period, it became, um, slowly, very slowly obvious that I would have to make huge compromises with the work in order to meet the kind of the health and safety aspect of the work and the site. Um, so we then um, looked at that entire site again and um, looked at this kind of um, space where it had kind of a pathway and also allowed people to kind of sit and enjoy the space as well. And so this is a sculpture. Um, the way I titled my work is numbers, so they kind of go in chronological order. And then they have um, just a kind of a, a word as a descriptive so that I can actually, I don't remember the numbers, so I can actually just kind of uh, locate where they are in, in terms of the order. So um, this is a work, um, part of the MESH series, and it started off as um, a painting, and it was a painting series that um, was an offspray. So I call them kind of offspray painting because we used to use the paper pieces uh, to test out spray cans and um, the flow and consistency and the more we were producing these kind of paper pieces that used to get thrown away, um, the more I got really excited because they had a, a sculptural element, they had a kind of physical quality about those paintings. And so I then spent a few months kind of trying to figure out a way how I can get this painting out of the wall and into the space. And so this is um, a work that's kind of outdoors, that really interacts with the space, the people, the light, um, and also the wind, so it moves. So I worked with um, engineers from Arab on this. And the first engineer that I worked on was not at all very collaborative. Um, and he was, you know, really difficult to, um, have conversations with um, and kind of really rigid in his um, process and thoughts as well um, and approach to the project. Um, so I had to kind of really put my foot down and push back and 
pushing back allowed me to work with someone who is absolutely amazing. Um, he was really funny as well. He, he tried to make light of the whole um, structure that we were trying to create. And I had to keep quite serious about how minimal I wanted the structure and how I wanted... Um, the people that were living there or using the space or working there would experience the work. So it was really important that the structure really allowed the work um, to exist the way it does, basically. Um, so these are some of the, so that, yes, yeah, so that's, I'll show a video later. And um, what would be really great and uh, stop me from being nervous, talking to everyone, is if you have questions, please ask. It's really, it would be amazing to have a conversation. So, um, and the next project is, um, this was quite a challenge. Um, so I work with a lot of um, found and ready-made materials. Um, I do a lot of residencies as well. It's, um, it's an opportunity to kind of get to know a place, get to know the people, get to know the environment, um, and also, you know, for me, doing residencies, it really allows me to kind of have a break from the studio and um, look at materials that I haven't looked at before. Um, so this is, um, this is uh, I've done a couple of projects on this site uh, in Sweden, and it's a sculpture park. And I did a site visit, and then after, straight after the site visit, obviously, the pandemic happened, and um, I was asked to do a permanent project there as well as some temporary ones and this was only meant to be up for like four months but it's still up I think and it's in their lake and I um, so the you know I kind of wanted to use materials that again that would be easily accessible and especially because of the pandemic and um, you know in terms of the climate change and what you know everyone's trying to do and kind of minimize on shipping and um, material cost um, I started looking at kind of locally sourced materials and it turns out actually um, one Askunst used to make bricks and um, terracotta tiles and things like that so um, these were some of the materials that were actually on site um, so this is a project um, where I was able to kind of um, produce this in the water. I loved walking around and seeing this kind of calm, contemplative space and wanted to kind of create something that really reflected that and that would kind of almost appear and disappear. So in certain location, it becomes quite transparent, which is quite difficult to um, document. This is the other location, which is a more permanent um, uh, commission, which um, is a pathway leading to the sculpture, um, to the sculptures in the in the woods, and um, this is, I think, um, oh, it doesn't say how long it is. Uh, I think it's about three hundred meters, and again. You know, the timing, I think, had a massive effect, the way I looked at um, how we navigate space, how we move around, how we actually, um, you know, interact with each other as well, and especially during the pandemic, you know, everyone's kind of trying to um, really move through space um, in a much more considerate way. And so I needed to, you know, I was like thinking how we would be able to kind of um, move around and allow each other to kind of pass and also enjoy kind of the surrounding. And so I used kind of this geometry to really create a pathway that allowed us to kind of, you can see where you can take pauses and allow people to pass through. Um, which I re it was really great to actually see it. So this all happened remotely um, during the pandemic. Um, this is a project in Folkestone. Um, I, you know, I do do projects, community-based projects now and then, um, which um, can be quite tough because the budget is really, really tight, and it means you have to be really clever about how you. Um, 
how you really kind of engage with the space and the materials and what's available. Um, so these are initially when they approached me, I thought I'd be able to design the beach hut. So I was really excited. I was like, great, this is going to be my first kind of architectural project. But um, they were like, no, no, we've got to use these off the shelf, um, you know, beach huts that really are not very expensive. And you can see the quality of it. And they were also kind of spread across, um, you can see on the bottom um, image that how far they were kind of spread. And I thought, how do I kind of connect those beach huts? How do I kind of bring things together a bit more? And also um, create movement within the work. And, um, and so the best way I thought would be to use geometry. And I love using geometry that is quite directional, that really um, encourages movement as well. So, um, this is a project that I did with a fashion designer um, called Roxatna. I can never pronounce her surname, but it's an up there. <laughs> and uh, she's amazing. And she actually started off um, doing architecture and then moved on to fashion. And like it's really great that we kind of get to each other's work and it's it's really interesting having conversations with her and talking about color and form and the way she approaches material as well um so this was a project um we had to kind of, we had one day to install for a one day show and straight after that show it, we had 2 hours to deinstall and it was really stressful because usually with an installation, you have a lot more time um, and a lot more kind of, a um, uh, lot more art specialists to kind of work with. So this was kind of working with a really different kind of team and having to come up with solution quite fast. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it was interesting kind of working this way and I'm glad I did it. Um, I don't know if I'm entirely happy with this work, but I think it's, um, it was definitely kind of gave me ideas. It definitely made me think about the work as well. Um, this is a, another project where um, it started off because um, I, I had, my father had left some land that um, all our siblings had to then kind of sign, um, sign over, but it wasn't enough just to kind of sign the paperwork. We had to go to the registry office in Bangladesh um, where we have to apply our thumbprint. And the registry office consisted of um, kind of a reception room and then three different offices. And the entire interior of the building was just covered by thumbprints so every time um, people went in it, they just kind of rubbed it off onto the wall and it was just I felt incredibly moved by that experience of walking into that space and seeing all these fingerprints and it was like this overwhelming feeling of connection with architecture land and body in so many ways and I wanted to um, really kind of create that um, experience um, and experience of movement and you know and it was really interesting so again I did this project with students um, art and architecture students and you know we had kind of various conversations and because it was in a stairwell as well so you're kind of moving um, you know, so there was lots of things kind of going on there. So, um, these are um, a kind of a wall painting, or I'd call them kind of drawing series that um, I started doing. And it started off um, with uh, Joseph Albers. It was a show uh, in response to a book called Interaction of Colour. And... For me, it was great because he's one of the artists that I've really been inspired by and influenced by. And so doing something that really um, uh, looked at the way he was looking at colour was really exciting. Um, and this series stems from works that I've been doing for quite a few years, which I call them kind of bar works, where you apply colour to either side. 
and if you stagger them you see colours interacting with each other and I thought how can I recreate that um, and use colours that I love using but also create a calm quite contemplative space. You might not kind of think that um, but I, I do sometimes think that you can achieve um, you know that kind of calm contempla contemplative um, moments with bright uh, bold colours. Um, this is one of my, I'd say one of my kind of favourite projects. Um, it started off in Bangladesh and it was a project that I um, kind of has a lot of my childhood kind of memories um, embodied in it and I used to weave baskets with my daddy in Bangladesh who um, was this lady that used to look after me. I was um, I was quite a challenge for my mum, so she had to get someone in specifically to take care of me. And I used to find um, basket weaving quite calming and quite, you know, the repetitiveness. Um, and the other thing I used to do was um, pray five times a day and read the Quran. And so I think the repetition and, um, and the rhythm and, you know, all of those things kind of has had a massive effect on the way that I work or approach uh, projects. And so I wanted to create something. Um, oh, and again, there was a brief with the project. Um, there was a really tight budget as well, and it had to be materials that I used um, from Bangladesh as well. Um, so... Instantly, I thought about the basket installation and I thought about my experiences of light in Bangladesh and those moments, childhood moments that I had growing up. I used to spend a lot of time actually staring into space and really seeing light change. So either it was kind of the bathing pools or the rice fields, um, which used to just get covered completely during monsoon season. So it was just really bringing all those elements together and creating something that light kind of filtered through. Um, and this was really interesting. I, I made this proposal, but I had no idea if it was going to work. And then suddenly, you know, they were like, yes, let's do it. And I was like, oh, I can't swear. I was about to say, <laughs> I need to, um, you know, test it out before I... Um, so I had to then quickly buy some baskets on eBay and I, where I was living and working at the time was this engineering factory, um, had no windows and it had like the tiniest little skylight. Um, so I basically put together like 20 baskets and suspended it to see if it was going to even work and that was my kind of test. Um, so these are kind of what was quite amazing with this material is that how structural it becomes when you start um, putting them together. Um, and so I think this was the fourth time I've done it. And I've started using less and less um, wires, steel wires, to suspend it because it becomes really structural as you put them together. Um, this is what's really great about being an artist and being an artist that loves working with material and being hands-on. And I think it's so important, even as architects, to really, for you to ha get your hands dirty and physically work with material. If it's a material that you're interested in, to actually really push those material and see you know, how far you can push it, what the limit, you know. And there isn't, you know, it, you'd be quite surprised how far you can go with some of the materials. Um, I feel like I'm going on for a while. There are a lot more projects, so tell me if I'm... If, well, I'm if you'd like to transition to questions, we can yeah. maybe just yeah. open it up, and I, yeah. I can start with one, maybe. Okay. Um, but I would like to say that this is really intended to be a conversation. So yes, I haven't heard any questions. I cannot <laughs> believe, and I that understand. You're all silent. The, I, I also hate hearing the sound of my own voice for yeah, long periods of time. So please, the reason why students are at the table and I invited students to be closer yeah. is that we are intending for you to be comfortable to ask questions. Otherwise, I'll start asking you guys questions. Yeah, so <laughs> you, yeah. 
will point at you and you'll have to stand up and answer a question. Yeah. Um, but I guess maybe I'll start with one um, because I noticed that you actually work quite a lot with physical models and some of the model photos here and then in your own studio you work quite a lot with models and I think that's something that um, a lot of the students here can relate yeah. to. So could you speak more on like your practice and your process of translating yeah. ideas into form um, with model making? Yeah, I really struggle to communicate. So English actually is it's now my first language, but it used to be my second language. So I realized that um, I used to get really nervous going into um, presentation for competitions and, and things like that. So it's very much like what you guys would be doing when you're out in the big wide world. Um, and presenting in front of a, a panel of eight to kind of 12, it's like, it can be quite difficult and especially if there are people there that really don't understand, um, you know, and don't have um, art or architectural background, um, you need to find a way to kind of really show. Um, I remember actually when I made um, my proposal for a branch and I had kind of uh, proposed it for outdoors and into, um, in the courtyard where, you know, the glass, it's similar to this, but in, in the concrete kind of um, paving. And they were like, are you sure, are you sure we can't put it inside? You know, it, you know, this is where we normally exhibit. And I was like, no, 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 you know, you want, you know, I'm responding to the light in Dubai. And I really, you know, it really needs to be outdoors. And they were like, but I think it could work indoors if we set up the lighting and everything, you know, it will be perfect. And I was kind of insisting and insisting. And in the studio at the time, so I had moved out of um, the studio without any windows into another studio that it was on two level and again had no windows. But it, you know, when you open the door, it, we usually open the door to kind of see. And so I had the door open. And immediately at that point, when I was like arguing with them, and I thought I could turn on the light on my phone and show them what it does, that you know, we had sunlight flooding into the space and just really um, reflecting color across the surface. And that was like a perfect example for me where I literally didn't have to say anything. They left going, okay, we get it. It needs to be outdoors, we'll figure out a way. And the hard work was kind of done in trying to convince um, you know, the client and the, the judges and, and everyone. So, um, you know, for me, that's one aspect, you know, being able to communicate the material that I'm proposing. Um, and the other thing is also to be able to see something at a scale, you know, you're making a little model and then to see something that could be just completely changed. Um, so I've actually... I, I do make really small works, but I also make huge works. Um, I also worked for um, an architect called Will Allsop, and you know I used to do model making, and so I learned quite a lot through that process. Um, and um, I mean, I would really recommend, like, if you're doing architecture, that you really build your experience um, through different. You know, I wouldn't limit, and I wouldn't sit just sit in front of a computer I would find opportunities where you can really open your eyes um, yeah. maybe I'll open So my question is sort of similar to that I guess in a way talking about your process <coughs> excuse me so you work with a lot of different materials in site-specific locations. And the first project you spoke about, you said you were inspired by the, the paint splatter. And then you also spoke about the one of the path in particular I'm thinking about, where I'm assuming it was like an assigned yeah. program. Um, so how does your process vary in that way, like whenever you're assigned something specific or when inspiration strikes? Yeah. Um, is there a balance between the two? Um, and then how does that affect like I, your, also I, how do materials play into that process, I guess? For the, 
For the project in Sweden, I had something in mind which, um, which turned out to be incredibly expensive and it was also um, going to be really difficult to produce. So they actually produced some samples and, um, and when they started doing that they realised that it was going to take a very long time to produce this pathway with um, a stone that I had wanted to use. It was locally sourced stone but it was going to be really expensive to have them cut and there was going to be a lot of wastage produced as well. So we had to then go back to the table and look at again, you know, what are the materials that could come within the budget, you know, and then usually I don't like to ask budget at first because I think when you ask it, um, it can constrain, but actually I found over time it can be quite helpful. It, it stops a lot of time being wasted. Um, and so we, the way we look at um, projects, and particularly international projects, is um, locally, you know, looking at the kind of the local area and seeing what's kind of um, available and, you know, what's kind of recognised and, um, and it's kind of easily accessible. And I like working with materials that you recognize and that you can you just need to kind of approach it or kind of just have a slight shift and it can change the way uh, you look at that material again um, talking about like what we were talking about earlier that I did do a project um, this is something I did for the Royal Academy summer exhibition which um, can you see um, the video? So this was um, collaboration with an architect called Neil McLaughlin and he um, and I were kind of a recent RAs and we were asked to have a room each um, to produce, um, to curate a room each. And we had quite a few people in common and the, the project or the theme of the, this year's summer exhibition was climate. And immediately, the first person we thought about was an um, architect called Marie, Marina Tabassum, who is based in Bangladesh. I'm sure you know of her work. And I've collaborated with Marina before, and she's this incredible um, architect who I think is doing amazing projects that really um, makes you think about material, makes you think about what's going on currently and, and the issues surrounding it as well and so this was a project that we both thought about and then decided to actually bring our room together and combine art and architecture so you can see there actually how we were um, trying to bring together all the different kind of um, you know uh, we were told the architecture room used to be very dry because all the models were in perspex cases and they're all kind of, you know. Um, so we wanted to kind of break that up and we selected Marina to do something that was actually life, you know, life size. Um, and uh, we also did something with um, an engineer, you know, engineer and stonemasoners who were also looking at climate and how to kind of. So they were looking at climate um, crisis uh, from a prevention point of view, whereas Marina was looking at kind of climate in terms of how to kind of respond to it and um, and react to it basically and deal with flooding in Bangladesh. And then Boonsoon, who is looking at materials in a completely different way and, you know, using um, elephant dung and other materials. So it's really, you know, kind of was fascinating collaborating with Neil and curating something like that. Yeah. So from my understanding, public art seems to have a lot of hoops to jump through, so congrats. <laughs> um, but I'm also curious about the other ways that you collaborate with architects, mm -hmm. maybe in detailing connections between material or rendering in the yeah. initial stages of the process. Yeah. Um, so I've, uh, I've worked with a few architects uh, before, um, 
Peter Cully, who uh, is actually based in LA, um, and his practice is called Spatial Affairs. So he's actually designed my home and studio. And that was kind of interesting. Um, he used to spend a lot of time in the studio and just observing. And I found it quite strange. I was like, why are you, you know, kind of sitting there and staring? And, and it was really interesting, the questions he would ask as well. And I haven't seen any other architect's work like that. He spent a lot of time observing, observing how... So I used to live and work in the warehouse secretly to save money so that I could develop this space. And when I was, you know, I've got two kids and my kids, um, you know, Jabril, I think it was about five and I had built a three-bedroom flat in there um, for myself, Jabril and my nanny. And when he would come home, he would slam the, the flat door shut and, um, and just say, this is my time now you know, no one else. So I used to have my office in the flat, but he used to push everyone else out, slam the door shut. And this was something that he kind of liked saying, you know, so it's really important that you have this, you know, separation from live work space and really make that kind of physical as well. And so it's kind of, you know, so that was a kind of a different kind of approach and we're still friends. And he's my therapist, as well as my architect, and as well as my friend. I mean, it's really interesting working with him and the conversation we, you know, we have. And then there's Marina Tabassum. We collaborated on a project called um, Is This Tomorrow for Whitechapel. And I don't know, I mean, I, I don't, it's not, oh God, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to say something offensive. Okay. But... Um, I work with pretty strong women, and I, I don't know if there's a th kind of just an attraction there, um, but Marina is a really tough lady, and she does not uh, compromise. And it was really interesting how, you know, we kept kind of pushing each other. We kept kind of looking at um, ways to kind of still collaborate, but keep our identity and I guess there's a bit of ego involved as artists you know there's it's all you know big big egos in a room but I know architects have big, bigger egos so. <laughs> so it's um it's quite a challenge but I think the thing to remember is respecting each other's kind of discipline you know, people spend years, and this is why, you know, people are like, why did you get an architect to design your home and studio? You know, you could have done it. I was like, yeah, but I'd be building it forever. You know, I wanted to work with someone who really understood what I needed. Um, so it's really about having respect. It's really about being open and, and also listening. Um, so this is something that I kind of observed, Marina, the way she was working and the way she was listening and just giving each other the opportunity to kind of really, um, really um, express and talk about what, what we were thinking as well. And we, had, we started off actually being quite political. Um, for that project, for the Whitechapel project, because there was a lot going on. There was a lot going on in America in terms of Trump, and then there was a lot going on in the UK with possibility of Bro Boris coming over, and then Brexit. You know what all of those things meant, and how we could respond. And then we ended up, you know, the more conversation we had, we realised that we wanted to create a space where dialogue can happen where it wasn't about separation but actually bringing people together and so these are things that you know wouldn't happen if you're not having conversation with people so oh yes sorry <laughs> um, so this is a, a project that um, I wonder if I've got in the No, it's not in here. But it's part of a series that um, it started in the UK and 
actually started from the basket installation. So I went back after having done the installation in Bangladesh and I wanted to find a material that was one, um, I could apply colour and the other, it could be translucent and allow me to create layers and also have movement. So I started looking at a material that was more permanent, if you like, and structural as well. And so what you see at Moody is materials that you, you would recognise. I don't know if anyone does recognise, but it's used for a lot of construction, um, either kind of creating wall structures or planting. Um, and, you know, and I wanted to kind of use something that was off the shelf. And so I started applying colour to those. I actually made a little model of it and, um, and just just tried to kind of see what would happen um, if I started kind of putting panels together and how it might kind of stand on its own. And so the more I made, the, you know, the bigger it grew. But what was really exciting about it was as you walk around or walk through it, the colours shift um, and they appear and disappear. And I'm really interested, and it just really makes sense to be part of the show that you curated because, and to also, this is the first time that I've done this series outdoors. And it's, you know, for me, it's a big deal to be able to produce this outside because light is a, a, a big part of that work and that series as well. Um, so you've got to really experience it and see it in the different um, day. Uh, time of day as well and time of year as well it really changes um, yeah we might have time for one more question do any other students have questions so I I've actually encountered a very interesting concept of working artists working um, between the gap of art and life yeah. and it's really interesting how you are like um, bringing in daily objects like the baskets yeah. and stuff uh, and like locally sourced materials um, in Sweden into your artwork so I'm wondering because you also have like a very interesting transition from Bangladesh to London right yeah. so it's like very different background and how do you think your daily life affects your artwork and how your art will like um, affect you in reciprocal like the translation between them. Um, so I've been told that my life is absolutely crazy and I pack too much in. And my work is a reflection of what I aspire my life to be, which is to be very minimal and not have too much to do and have a calm, quite contemplative kind of... Um, that's what I would love. Um, I mean, I kind of, I don't pray five times a day. I don't read the Quran. I haven't done it since, um, since I moved to the UK. And it's really strange. I, I just used to love the sound. I, lo I used to love the um, recitation of the Quran and the repetition and the rhythm. And so I'm constantly wanting my life to be really um, in sync with my work. And I think it's this kind of, um, um, what's, there's a word where you're constantly, when you're striving to constantly, and it's, and, and I also, I'm just kind of full of energy and ideas. I need to kind of also release them. Um, and during the pandemic, I mean, it's a good example. Um, I really struggled. I struggled to kind of maintain um, work because the team at the studio had to shut down and I also had to homeschool, I was doing filming and all of this and I realised that I was going nuts and absolutely crazy and not getting any sleep and then I remember, you know, there's an artist that I absolutely love, it's Agnes Martin and I remember, you know, she kind of isolated herself and, um, and she created these beautiful paintings um, and I thought, what was the reason, you know, what was it that kind of made her do that and, and the results of it as well. So I started doing watercolours as a way of um, 
calming myself down and really it meant that I could handle everything else but that process of the watercolours um, actually I have some on my Instagram you, you can see um, but I got stopped quite a lot so the kids um, you know were interrupting quite a lot and every time I got interrupted or I had to stop it created a rhythm and so you could see it visible in the brush mark and so I would apply paint and then I could see how many grids I could do in one go and so every time I stopped that created so they I feel like I don't know about other artists but definitely for me everything is kind of intertwined and um, I think it kind of links with yeah I don't know if I answered your question. I feel like I went on. No, that's <laughs> great. I think that we are, with, without any more time, but we yeah. just wanted to say thank you so much for sharing your work with us and your practice and to visit Rana's installation at the Moody as well as the opening for Urban Impressions. And then there will also be the installation right outside of the yeah. uh, Anderson Hall here. So, And thanks to the students who have been helping. Uh, yeah, thank you so our... much for all your help. Um, <laughs> I know. Emily, you've been amazing putting all those structures together. I think so. they will all so. dream of zip ties forever. <laughs> <laughs> you could do this in your sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rana. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.